<clears throat> this is going to be your first um, sort of work with me on my PowerPoints. This is one in which this won't count towards any grades whatsoever. I won't put it on any quizzes or tests at all going forward. It's more for you just to sort of observe, you know, ab absorb, uh, and just sort of listen and watch, see what happens, see what you think. Um, this is a concept uh, that I want you to sort of get, a use to get used to the style I have for my presentations. In giving presentations, if there's something that's important that I think that you're going to need to memorize, I'll probably repeat it a, 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 at least two to three times and really emphasize that that's something that you need, need to memorize. So nothing in this process, this particular PowerPoint is something you need to memorize for the class itself. It's just sort of to get used to how things work. All right, so here we go. So we're going to talk about the history of the photographic process, basically why was photography invented. This class that you're in is not about the history of photography. I want to make that very clear. So I'm not going to be testing you on certain pictures and the names and titles and things like that. It's not that at all. <clears throat> you're welcome. What it is, rather, on this particular part is, why did they make it? Why did they invent it? Who thought it up? Why did they think it up? Where did it come from? Those types of things. So in order to sort of study the history of the photographic process, we have to go back well before photography was brought about. And we talk about a little bit about the history of art. So if we think way back to what was the first sort of art out there in the world course type of thing, well, most people would probably agree that it was early caveman paintings. Really simplistic stick figure stuff. Not, you know, there's no color. There's no different colors to it. There's basically only one color to it. Um, very rudimentary stick figures, just basically this is what we do. We hunt animals and stuff. So not really super deep, uh, just, a, just a recording of what they did during those periods of times. So very rudimentary. We move forward into the Egyptian hieroglyphic stuff. Well, we're getting better. You know, it's starting to look a little bit better now. We have some different colors to things. Uh, we have skin tones. We have different shapes. A little bit better form on the human figure. It's still very flat, but still a little bit better. Hey, it's a step up from what we had, right? So we keep going further. We get into um, early Christian art. Uh, still very rudimentary, but now we're starting to get some shapes. We have some hands and fingers that we can start to make out. We can start to sort of recognize people if we knew them. Um, we keep going into Byzantine. Uh, we start to almost get a little three-dimensionality going there. Uh, obviously, this particular artist didn't go take any 3D or 2D drawing classes. If any of you have ever taken a 2D or 3D drawing class, you'll get the joke. When you do take a 3D or 2D drawing class, you'll get the joke. This person did not study 2D or 3D drawing. It's not that way. Anyhow, but we do see some improvement. We're seeing jumps and leaps and bounds. We keep going. We have Gothic art. And again, now we're even getting shading. They still haven't figured out how to draw feet yet. Uh, but we're getting some shading, some tonalities, some em almost emotions you can pull from the image and things like that. Um, and then we get into things like Renaissance art, where now we're really starting to find expressionism. People are having style of things. We have to remember, too, that a good majority of art during this period of time is not artists going, you know, this is what I feel. I'm going to just... You know, this is my statement to the world. That's not how art worked back then, for the most part. For the most part, art back then was rich people wanting paintings for walls. Uh, so this is what you're going to do for me. You're going to make a painting of me or something that I want you to paint. So that's how a lot of artists, not all, but a good amount of them worked. So we keep going 1600 AD. Let's jump into the 1700s. And suddenly things start to look a lot better. Now we start to have these paintings that are like, you know, that has some real characteristics of of a photograph. It's really starting to have photographic type qualities. It looks vastly different than anything else we've seen. Same here, you know, another painting, this is the late 1700s, again, paintings that have some real realism. They're starting to really look like something really did. Well, what happened? Why did the, what was this change? Well, the change came about this thing, this device called a camera lucida. And the camera lucida originally was found, was sort of invented in a way in the 1400s. There are some that would argue and say that the Chinese invented it back in the 400s or so. Be that as it may, here's what the camera lucida looks like. It's a device that hooks up to the, to the artist's drawing board. And there's a little prism at the very top. Here's a closer shot of it. So there's like a little prism at the top. And so what would happen is, is that this device let you look down at your paper, but because of the prism, it made one eye look at your subject. So one eye is looking at the subject, 
while you're looking down at the paper so it sort of superimposes the subject onto your paper so essentially you're tra you're tracing and it would look something like this this is what it would look like when you're working with a camera to see that sort of superimposes the person on top of the picture so you can sort of trace it so they're kind of cheating that's how they got these better paintings and better paintings and better paintings they still do very much of this today as well Another device they found, they sort of figured things out, was a thing called the Camera Obscura that was in the 1500s. Again, these are not things you have to write down. I'm never going to quiz you, those types of things. Camera Obscura was basically a hole in the wall. So if you find a hole small enough in a wall or drapery or things like that, sometimes you can have this effect with uh, blinds uh, on windows. If direct sun is sort of, you know, if you let enough sunlight through just a certain way through a very, 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 very small hole, it can actually project the image on another wall. There's ways to actually do this with like, for example, if you put tin foil on your wall, on your, oops, uh, you put tin foil on your window, you know, cover up your window completely with tin foil, let's say, make the room really dark and poke one little teeny tiny hole. You can sometimes have this effect happen. Well, they made, they did this in order to help, uh, they figured this out and they started to use it for a drawing aid. Uh, so they bring these little rooms around. They even had portable ones that were like little miniature tents they could bring around in order to be able to see things like this. <clears throat> the figure on the right is a portable one where the person is, is the, the image is coming through the tube there, that tube on the far left hand side, sort of a near, I think it's letter B, that tube is not a lens as we know it. It's not glass. It's just a tube that has, that's made out of metal that has a hole in the end of it, a very small hole um, to sort of set this light coming through. And the light coming through projects an image and then it would project it onto the mirror and bounce it up onto this other piece of glass where the artist would then trace it to sort of get the idea of what they were trying to concert, you know, make, sort of make up like that. So in a way, artists were kind of cheating a little bit. So let's go forward. Another really big step is around the same time in the 15 and 1600s, especially in the 1600s and later, they started messing with the periodic table, the table of elements. They started figuring out, you know what, what happens when you combine this with this? We sort of have to remember the time is, is a situation where it's not like they have radio or TV or the internet or something like that. They got 24 hours a day to fill, and they started messing around with chemicals and started figuring out what happens to what. <clears throat> Finding out things like if they have a piece of silver, most people don't always have silver. Some people do. I mean, my parents had the whole silver set. But if you have silver, uh, like a tea set that's made out of silver, what happens to that silver as it sort of sits over time? A lot of times you'll see silver has this, this effect called tarnishing, and it's the effect of the oxygen on the silver itself. Well, they said, wait a minute. If silver turns different colors with oxygen, what if we put, I don't know, salt on it and then expose it to the sun? So they do all those experiments. So along comes this. They start making chemicals together and start to figure it out. And along comes, in 1826, the world's first photograph. This is taken by a gentleman named Joseph Niepsch. I'll show you his name in just a second. This is 1826. It's a very odd picture because it's an eight hour exposure. In order to create this image, it was eight hours. This photograph is small. It's about the size of a three by five print or so. And it's actually made onto pewter. Pewter is this type of, the type of metal. It's a very soft, porous metal. They usually use pewter for like uh, um, steins and mugs. You know, you, if you went to um, things remembered in the, well, you can't go to the mall now. But when you used to, way back when we used to go to malls, there's a stuff called Things Remembered where you can get metal engraved and stuff. Anyways, they use pewter. It's really soft metal. Long story short is he used this uh, mixture sort of of asphalt on top of the pewter and then exposed it in that same camera, camera uh, obscure I showed you a minute ago, to create this image. So <clears throat> that was the world's first photograph. Joseph Nietzsche told you he was, that was his name. He teams up with another guy named Joe, Louis de Guerre. There was another, there's a third man who sort of in, helped invent photography. His name is Henry Fox Talbot. He was in, in, he was in England, so he wasn't as famous. Niepce and Daguerre were in France. So this is Joseph Niepce and Louis Daguerre. Niepce is on the left, Daguerre is on the right. They were sort of like the Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs of photography. In that Steve Jobs couldn't build a computer if you gave him the parts. He, would, he could envision what it could do and think it through and sell it, but he couldn't make it. Wozniak was really the brains of it. Same kind of concept here. Joseph Niepce thought it all up. Louis de Guerre sold the product. 
Uh, Henry Fox Talbot, that's Henry Fox Talbot on the bottom right. Um, he was a gentleman who invented photography. It's sort of a different form of photography. It was in England, not as well noted as much, but anyways, let's go on. So <clears throat> to make this early photography, it was not an easy or safe device. They realized that the whole eight hour thing wasn't going to work. So they started messing around with other types of metals and other types of chemicals, and they eventually settled on copper. They figured if you can get a copper plate and etch it with mercury fumes, you can start to make some photographs a little faster. Yes, dangerous. And unfortunately, it eventually led to Joseph Niepce dying in his dark room. Well, it was before him and Daguerre, him and Daguerre had already teamed up and said, you know, we got to make this work. They hadn't come up with a name for the process yet. They sort of hadn't thought it out yet. Joseph Niepce dies, and Louis Daguerre's like, God, I don't know what I'm going to call this thing. Well, you know what? <sighs> he invented it. <clears throat> I might as well call it after me. So he called it the Daguerreotype and sort of abandoned Joseph Niepce as a, as a founding member. Anyhow, so the Daguerreotype, very famous type of photogra photography. Like I said, mercury vapors etched onto copper, really dangerous. Uh, like I said, super dangerous fumes. The images once created were sensitive to light, which means you couldn't put them on the wall. You couldn't, you know, leave them out for very long because they they turn and they reverse and things like that. So this is a daguerreotype type, type camera. It looks a lot like what we saw with that one I showed you a few moments ago, the um, the camera obscura. And what we're seeing on the front of this device is not a lens as we know it. There's no glass in that. You can see the little piece of metal at the bottom of the what we would think of as the lens, and that's the shutter. So you close up the top of that to let light through and expose it for, you know, a mi 30 seconds to a minute. And this is what a daguerreotype looked like. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a piece of uh, copper. The interesting thing about this is about the, uh, each one of these is about the size of a three and a half by five picture or so. Um, and so when you received it, it was folded up in this, this sort of wooden box with a velvet on top of it. Um, and that wasn't necessarily decorative. It was no more designed for the fact that they wanted it to last. Because, if, again, if you left it out like that, that would, de that would uh, degrade over time. The other interesting thing about the daguerreotype and pictures like this for quite some time, the exposure times were pretty long. And they were one-ups, which means when you took a picture, you couldn't say, hey, give me two copies of that. You had to take, if you wanted two copies, you had to take two physical pictures. <clears throat> the exposure times were 30 seconds to a minute, depending on where you were. So that's why people aren't exactly smiling, because you have to hold that pose for 30 seconds to a minute. You can't blink, you can't move. <clears throat> so consequently, they had these different devices. They had people leaning on stuff all the time, pictures from this era. You always see people like leaning on something. They put their hands and their elbows on something to sort of keep them propped up. They also had devices where they would put, they would sort of lock your head into place. So they had these clamps they'd come along and put on the back of your neck and the back of your head to make sure you stood still <laughs> for the picture type situation. <clears throat> along comes this thing called the wet collodion process. So that sort of pioneered photography. And instead of having to use the um, mercury and, and, and copper, they used uh, glass. So they would get these glass plates, and what they would do is they would get this emulsion, the, the, the part of it that would actually expose the picture, and it was like a jelly. Think of it like a like grape jelly. wasn't well, purple, though. Uh, and you'd have to paint this onto the glass, and it would have to remain wet while you took a picture. So if you were a traveling photographer at that time, you probably had this type of, type of situation where you had a dark room that was a tent. You'd go into the tent, paint the glass with the emulsion. It had to stay in the dark. So you put a cover on it, put it into the camera, take a picture, and you had to develop it right then and there. So you couldn't like pre-get pre it ready, take a picture, and then develop it when you felt like it. It was right then and there. Uh, this is a traveling uh, uh, photographer from that era where they had all the supplies in the dark room and stuff like that in the back of, the, in the back of that uh, uh, wagon. Um, eventually, we got flexible or gelatin film, film as we sort of know it. This is a gentleman named George Eastman, a guy, he didn't invent it, but he took credit for it. He invented the Kodak Company, and it was in 1884. Uh, eventually, he also, too, when they made this gelatin film, because they realized that he, George Eastman wanted to sort of bring photography to the masses. He wanted everybody to be able to photograph, because up until 1884, if you wanted to take pictures, you had to have some real harsh knowledge on chemicals because it didn't come like in a kit. You had to mix the chemicals raw. 
uh, and the film was hard to work with, so he wanted to make photography available to the masses. So he devised this thing called the Brownie camera, and this is a Brownie camera from the, after the cent turn of the century. Uh, the ones before the turn of the century looked just like that. <laughs> they're very small. They're about the size of a, of a lunchbox type situation. Um, and so when you bought this, it came with 100 sheets of film, and you, you bought it, and you took the pictures. You would return the whole camera. They would develop the film and print them and then fill it back up with film again. So how did George Eastman become rich? He only charged a dollar. So it was only a dollar for these the initial brownies with film in it. Uh, so that's sort of how he made his money. Not very good cameras, horrible pictures, but it sort of you know, threw photography into the hands of the common person. All right, we're going to go into the, we're going to turn into the next century. In the 20th century, there's this guy named Oscar Barnack. He invented the Leica camera company, which is still around today. Um, uh, he invented the first 35 millimeter or handheld cameras. Cameras up until before this point were rather large and cumbersome. He invented the 35 millimeter camera, much easier to work with. So that's him there. That's Oscar Barnack. Kind of a scary looking dude. And this was the first Leicas. These were the first type of Leica cameras. Very small, very lightweight. Uh, the, the lenses would collapse back into the camera so they could be easily uh, toted around. Leica is very well known uh, as being the best camera you can get. Uh, not the sexiest, not the most feature driven, but as far as if you want the best image quality, it still is Leica to this day. Even in the digital realm, Leica is the best. There's not The second place is a far rung down from where uh, Leica is. All right, let's keep going. History of digital photography. Well, I wrote it to, in order to get my master's degree, I had to write a book. So my uh, the person who was helping me on the book said, you know, you ought to write like a uh, introduction uh, chapter about the history of digital photography. I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. So I start investigating it. And it turns out the person we can most credit, in my opinion, uh, the most credit, the reason why digital photography happened, the lead, the lead up to it was... Of all people, Bing Crosby, the Bingster, the guy that did White Christmas. So this is Bing Crosby. Why would he do that? What was he? What do you mean? He didn't he sing? Yeah, he sang, danced too. Anyways, he had a radio program. This is in the 30s and the 40s. He had a radio program that was sort of the medium of the day. Well, the problem was is that a couple problems. When you made a radio program, you had to run it live. So, because the only recordings at the time were wax discs. This is a recording device from that era. And these wax discs were not exactly high fidelity. And number two is you couldn't edit them. So if you goofed up, you couldn't edit that out. So if you're playing a live performance and someone plays the wrong note or someone has to clear their throat, well, too bad. <clears throat> so he wanted to be able to make some sort of way of recording radio programs so he could broadcast it later on in different time zones and stuff like that. <clears throat> well, as oddness happens, sorry for the black screen. I'm still here. Um, so <laughs> as oddness happens, in World War, along comes World War II. And so one of his engineers, one of his tape engineers, or not tape engineer, but one of his sound engineers, is in the Army Corps of Engineers. Kind of an interesting, weird story. I'll make it fast. He, that engineer, as luck would have it, happens to be on the team that finds that the Germans in World War II were working on magnetic tape. They had figured it out, but they couldn't quite... They didn't know what to make of it. He happened to be on the team that found the magnetic tape. And so he finds the magnetic tape and comes back to Bing and says, Hey, Bing, guess what? I think I solved your problem, boss. And he says, Yeah, uh, bu -bu I think you did. So this guy makes this thing called the Ampex Tape Corporation, this big, huge tape corporation. And because of that, Bing is then able to start to record his, t his radio programs, which eventually led into the recording of TV programs as well. Big stuff. <clears throat> the first sort of digital sensor that took a digital image, not video, not, you know, not video type things, is Texas Instrument in 1969. They made the first CCD. CCD stands for Charged Coupled Device. Not something I'm going to test you on. <clears throat> they, wanted to make a, they wanted to make a telephone that you could use and see the person at the same time, well, like we have now with our meetings. Anywho, Kodak developed the very first digital camera uh, in the mid-'70s, didn't really make a big hit in the splash world of photography because a couple problems. One is it recorded the picture onto cassette tape. So if you remember cassettes, 
you had to, you know, if you listen to one side of the cassette, you had to flip it over in your car or your device and flip it over and listen to the other side. When you recorded pictures with this camera, you took a picture, had to wait for it to record. When it was done, you had to flip it over and take pictures on the other side. So that sort of <laughs> wasn't productive. Coupled with the fact that I'm going to go with the sexy factor is about a minus seven on this. That's the co that's the world's first digital camera. So not exactly you know like a, not exactly a Mercedes Benz you know, uh, not exactly sexy factor. So not it, they never it never went public. Nobody ever bought it. Um, Eventually, there's this thing called analog electric cameras. I'm going fast because I don't want it to be a super long video, and you don't have to take notes anyways. Uh, Sony made this company. So Sony made a camera called the Mavica, like looked like that. Uh, used floppy disks, but it wasn't digital in the fact that it was really a video camera that took stills, so it wasn't digital as we sort of know it. Um, that's the Mavica. There it had inter in, 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 interchangeable lenses and stuff like that. All right. The things there's a thing called an analog to digital converter. That's a class I took that that's six months of my life. I'm never getting back on how the ADCs work. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the very first digital camera that was for uh, like consumers to, to purchase off the shelf, the Apple Quick Take. It's one of the first. That's it there. Very small resolution, 640 by 480. Uh, didn't have a didn't have a screen to show you what the pictures looked like. The only data you had on the back of the screen was it showed you how many pictures you had, which was usually in the single single digits, um, and also how much battery life was remaining. The kind of interesting sort of side note to this is most time when you buy a digital camera, they come with software. Like if you buy a Canon camera, it comes with Canon software, different brands. This one came with software. It came with this little program not a lot of people at the time had heard of called Photoshop. So the first quick takes actually came with the first with with with, uh, with Photoshop. So that's this lecture. That's sort of my style on how I roll with my lectures. I've never been a person that's really into super finite detail. My quiz, my quizzes, my finals, my tests, my assignments are not so much detail oriented. It's more about can you demonstrate your knowledge of what I've asked you to do in that particular week's class. That's my dog Dutch in the background because he wants me to play. So with that, we're going to end this recording here in just a second uh, and because i got to go play with Dutch. Um, so, but basically, I said, I'm not a big, I'm not big uh, proponent of details. I'm more about do you get the concept. So concentrate more on the concept rather than details. I've never been a detailed uh, person as far as remembering how to, you know, exactly what year Ansel Adams was born or when you when did the Apple quick take come out I'm not going to quiz you on stuff like that great uh, okay that's our lecture for this particular period period of time and